Well, I'm excited about being in the Word of God with you this morning and trust that you too are excited about opening the Word of God and getting into it. And so Matthew chapter 5 is where we will be this morning. If you will please turn to Matthew chapter 5. We recently beheld together the opening of one of the largest recorded sermons that Jesus ever preached during his earthly ministry. Uh, this sermon, recorded in Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7, is commonly referred to as the Sermon on the Mount. And we saw why it is called the Sermon on the Mount as we looked at the context in chapter 5, verses 1 through 2. Let there be light. Um, we even went back further than chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, and we talked about how that there had been some 400 years of silence where God had not spoken. But then, after 400 years of silence with God not speaking, Jesus burst onto the scene. The light of the world burst onto the scene of world history piercing through the spiritual darkness of this world with the gospel, the good news of salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. And we drew our attention as we opened up this Sermon on the Mount. We drew our attention primarily to the teachings that Jesus began his sermon with. And those teachings are commonly referred to as the Beatitudes. And in getting our mind around what beatitude means, beatitude simply meaning happiness or bliss, and in grasping what Jesus is doing in these first 12 verses, we saw together that our Lord was bringing his audience to a greater understanding of what true happiness is and how we may have it. Jesus understands his audience. And he understands the circumstances that they are all facing. The circumstances politically, socially, economically that they are surrounded by. And he knows that they desire happiness. Who doesn't? Who doesn't desire true happiness among us here this morning? As a matter of fact, as I was preparing and looking at this once again, I was reminded of the opening of our country's Declaration of Independence that asserts the unalienable right of all men in the pursuit of happiness. And so man has always desired to be happy. Man will always desire to be happy and will pursue happiness. The tragedy exists not in the pursuit of happiness, but in the means to which they seek to attain that happiness. People are drawn by the deceitfulness of sin that always promises happiness, yet that sin always leaves the individual in unhappiness and utter misery. Jesus also understands that the subjective, emotional, and conditional happiness that most people know will not see them through. That type of shallow, subjective happiness will fall so short of true, lasting happiness. And so Jesus teaches what true happiness is, how to be a participant of true joy and bliss that will endure even through the most difficult of circumstances. I mean, just look with your eyes with me through the Beatitudes. Jesus talks about these individuals being happy uh, who have, verse 10, been persecuted for the sake of righteousness. Verse 11, People who are happy when people insult them and persecute them and say false things about them. These people are happy who are mourning, verse 4. These people are happy who are hungry and thirsty, verse 6. And so 
Their happiness is not contingent on the circumstances. Their happiness endures through the circumstances, you see. And so Jesus says to his listeners, this is the way one can be truly happy and blessed. I want to just ask you to remain seated this morning because we're going to just read one verse. And then we're going to look at that one verse together. Verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Today we're looking at what it means that Jesus has said, blessed are the poor in spirit. And I've simply titled the message today, Blessed are the Bankrupt. Because that is exactly what Jesus is saying. Those who are bankrupt are blessed. Now this is the exact opposite of what the world says. The world says, blessed are the rich. Blessed are the famous. Blessed are the powerful. Blessed are the prestigious. Uh, blessed are those types of individuals. As they only think of the outward man. But even as we have seen wealthy, famous, powerful individuals come out in the open over the last several days after the death of a famous actor and comedian and all admitting the battles of depression that they fight, all admitting that it's not in possessions, it's not in wealth, it's not in power, it's not in all the fame that one might have, that even with all of that going on in their life, they admit that they battle with deep depression. The reality is this. God has never made a soul so small that all of this world's possessions could satisfy it. And that is exactly why Jesus said, what does it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his soul? That all that this world has to offer, absent and void of God, cannot satisfy and bring contentment and true lasting joy and bliss and happiness to a soul. And so as we look at blessed are the bankrupt, as we look at blessed are the poor in spirit, I want to give you five headings to this one verse. Most of them we will look at quickly and we will primarily spend the majority of our time on number three. But first I want you to see the priority. We must understand the importance of character before we ever consider conduct. I want you to think about that statement. We must understand the importance of character before we ever consider conduct. Conduct that is lived out of the wrong character is hypocrisy. Now think about that. You can do good. The Pharisees, the Sadducees did good, but their conduct flowed out of a flawed character that was not matching and the motive for their conduct, and they were hypocrites. And so just conforming the outside to match a certain mold and to be able to mark off a certain checklist is not the goal. It must begin in the character and then flow out into the conduct. And so Jesus begins here. Jesus is teaching that all Christians are to be characterized by these beatitudes. This is a description of our character, not necessarily our conduct. And these beatitudes are not for the spiritually elite only. And, you know, you just have to graduate in your Christianity to achieve these beatitudes. No, these beatitudes are for every believer. We are all to be defined by all of these qualities and are to all exemplify all of these uh, qualities. They're to be seen in all of us. 
They're all to be seen in us. They are a whole that should not be divided, but fully present at the same time. In other words, it's not to work on being poor, and then we can work on being mournful, and then we can work on being gentle. These are not to be divided in such a way. They are a whole that is to be fully present at the same time. They're not random statements that are made. On the other hand, rather, they are a golden chain that are carefully linked together in a meaningful order. Listen to me. Just as the ninefold fruit of the Spirit is to be operative in the believer, so should the eightfold beatitudes be present in every Christian. And the good news is they can be by God's grace. Now this is not something that we just naturally do. This disposition that we look at in these Beatitudes is produced by God's grace alone via the Holy Spirit. Therefore, we must not define them in natural terms for we are considering the spiritual. We must define them in the terms that God gives to us because they are to be spiritually understood. And so there is even meaning and significance in the order in which Jesus gives these Beatitudes. The Beatitude that is before us today, blessed are the poor in spirit, is first because it is the key to all of the others that follow. There is intentional, logical significance to the order of these Beatitudes. Verse 3 is foundational and fundamental to all the rest becoming a reality. You can't mourn the way Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn until you're first poor in spirit. You'll not thirst and hunger for righteousness, verse 6, until you have first come to the place where you are poor in spirit. And so as we look at these things, we must understand there is even priority in where we are in what Jesus is saying. We cannot, and here's my point to bringing your attention to the priority of this, we cannot bypass this beatitude and go to the others. We can't bypass being poor in spirit and say, well, I just, I like being gentle more. I want to, I want to just get to the gentle part. We can't bypass this. This is first for a reason. There's no entrance into the kingdom of God without beginning here. Blessed are the poor in spirit for who? For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You can't side skirt this beatitude. That's exactly what the Pharisees tried to do in focusing on the external and bypassing the heart. But all of their efforts, Jesus said, only produced a twofold child of hell. As the Pharisees tried to bypass the heart and conform the outside of an individual and proselyte them to their rules and their regulations, Jesus said, in doing so, you have made them a twofold child of hell. And so the priority of this beatitude is of utmost importance. And in reality, every person is poor in spirit. The difference only exists in those who see it and realize it and those who don't. Number two, I want you to see the reality. Not only the priority, but the reality. Look at verse 3 in the first two words. Blessed are. Notice the pronouncement of the blessing is a present reality. This person's state of blessedness and joy and happiness is a present experience of satisfaction that will only be enhanced and will grow in the ages to come in their relationship with God. But today, right now, they are blessed. And so as we noted last week or a couple of weeks ago, blessed is oftentimes interpreted to mean happy. But not as the world defines happiness. 
This is more than that subjective emotion. This is not circumstantial, conditional, superficial happiness. Instead, being blessed here when Jesus uses this word means to be in a state of being declared blessed by God as one is under the favor of God in Christ. I want to say that again. Who's happy? Who has joy? Who experiences this bliss? The individual who is declared blessed by God because they are under the favor of God in Jesus Christ. And because they are under the favor of God in the person and work of Jesus Christ, this individual is under the favor of God. It carries with it this joy, this happiness that endures even through the most difficult and depressing of times. As I said before, blessed could just as well be called blissed here. Because it communicates the bliss and spiritual, deep spiritual joy. The profound happiness that is theirs in Jesus Christ. This blessedness is a joy and a happiness that is enjoyed here and now as well as to be enjoyed perfectly in the ages to come. It is a present reality that will always be a present reality because this person is blessed by God. Number three, and where we will spend the majority of our time. Number three, I want you to see the bankruptcy. The poor in spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Now here's where it is vitally important that we understand that we are not talking about humility and poverty in the way that the world defines it. This is not the humility that we often think of where a person is always standing against the wall in the background in a crowd of people. This is not a lack of courage or nervousness. This is not the meekness that equates to weakness in our culture. It's not even something that you are naturally born it with. Rather, it is the evidence, this poverty of spirit is the evidence of a divine work of God in an individual's life. It's important to know that he's not saying that material poverty is a blessed thing. The Bible nowhere teaches that physical, material poverty is a good thing. If that were so, think about this. Why would we be instructed to feed the hungry and clothe the naked? If they are blessed because they are materially poor, why would we hinder their blessedness? Think about that. And if the goal of God were for all of his people to take vows of poverty because you are blessed and you are happy when you disavow the things of this world and take a vow of poverty toward God and you live a life such as Mother Teresa did and others who are known for their vows of poverty, if that were the goal of all God's people, then how would we ever be able to fulfill the commands of God to give that individual something to drink, to be able to help the needy and to give to the poor? If I'm poor, how can I give to the poor? No, it's not that money is the root of all evil. Let's get the whole verse. It is the love of money that is the root of all kinds and sorts of evil. And so this is not even physical poverty. The person who is, I want you to hear me now, the person who is willingly or even unwillingly poor is no nearer to heaven than the rich man who is also without God. A lost person who is poor is no nearer to being saved than a lost man who's rich is to being saved. 
Now, Jesus has taught that there may be love for those riches that stand in the way as a hindrance, but that poor man does not get extra favor and mercy from God because of his poverty. No, they are equally lost, and poverty does not equate spirituality. This poor in spirit, what it is, is the opposite of a haughty, self-sufficient, I can do it on my own, my way attitude. That's what Jesus is talking about. Blessed are the ones who are not haughty, who are not self-sufficient, who do not say, I can do it my own way. It is certainly the opposite of the defiant attitude that is displayed in Exodus chapter 5 and verse 2 when Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey His voice? The Bible says in Proverbs 16, 5, Everyone who is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Assuredly, he, the proud in heart, will not be unpunished. Jesus is saying, happy is the person who is spiritually bankrupt. And that's why it's so important that we have this little prepositional phrase, blessed are the poor, here it is, two words, in spirit. In spirit communicates the area in which this poverty is being spoken of. He's not talking about blessed are the poor in possessions. He's talking blessed are the poor in spirit. The area, the focus of Jesus' words is not on the outer man, but on the innermost being of an individual. And so he says, blessed are the poor in spirit, meaning blessed are the people who are humble, who are lowly minded, who are self-abased, who are being reduced to total destitution in begging poverty, emptying themselves where the others have to do with filling. All the other beatitudes have to do with a filling. It is a filling with hunger and righteousness and, and so on and so forth. Blessed are the pure in heart and a, and a filling of one's heart with purity for they shall see God and so on. But here he's talking about the individual who sees that I have nothing. I can do nothing. I can bring nothing. I have nothing. I I am spiritually bankrupt. Why is this first? Why is this so important? Because you can't fill something that's already full. How are you going to be full of God when you're full of self? How are you going to be full of God when you're full of the world? And so this beatitude is very much about not only emptying ourselves, but realizing our emptiness before God. We must see our unworthiness before we can be made worthy in Christ. We must be poor in spirit before we can be made rich in spiritual blessings. Verse 3 will always come before verse 6. And so being poor in spirit is to be hopeless it is to be helpless. It is to be, as I said, spiritually destitute with nothing good or any merit to bring to the table, looking upon God as would a beggar in utter dependency upon God. Ultimately, what Jesus is talking about is our lowly attitude towards ourself in the face of God. Now, this is the opposite of the world's counsel, right? And this is why it takes faith. It, it takes saving faith that believes in Christ and desires to follow Christ because the world says you need more self-confidence. The world says you need more self-esteem. The world says you need to be self-sufficient. However, to feel anything other than absolute spiritual poverty and bankruptcy before God's presence is only to show that you've never truly been in God's presence. Think about that. We're not talking about in comparison to one another. 
Blessed are the poor in spirit is the attitude you have toward yourself in the face of God. When you are before the face of God, when you are before the presence of God, do you feel anything other than absolute spiritual bankruptcy in and of yourself? Or should God be happy that you're on his team? Or is it just a wonderful thing that you chose him? The Bible actually says he chose you, not the other way around. And that we love him because he first loved us. And this is why pridefulness and haughtiness and the things that we read, a proud heart in Proverbs 16, is an abomination to the Lord because God knows and understands who and what we are in and of ourselves outside of Christ and as enemies of God and as lovers of self and sin over His Son and our Savior, God it is abominable in the eyes of God that we would think we were anything that would be a glorious treasure for Him. Now, we'll get to that place, just not right now. Poor in spirit is Peter, who was naturally aggressive, yet said in Jesus' presence, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, Luke 5, 8. Poverty in spirit is the Apostle Paul who said concerning himself, I am the chief of sinners. It is the publican who could not even lift his face toward God when he declared in the presence of the publican, God, be merciful to me, the sinner, as he pound and beat upon his chest. Unlike the publican who said, God, I'm thankful I'm not like that man. And I'm thankful I'm doing this. And I'm thankful I'm good at this and all of the other things. The Bible says that it was this man, it was, it was um, uh, this man who beat upon his chest who went home right with God because he approached God in a right attitude and heart. God, have mercy to me, the sinner. So let me summarize. Just as conviction always precedes conversion, the gospel always condemns before it sets free. Do you see that that's what Jesus is doing here? Blessed are the poor in spirit. You've got to realize you're bankrupt first. Before you can be set free for whom the Son sets free is free indeed, you must first realize how condemned you are. Before you get to the gift of God, eternal life in Jesus Christ, you need to understand that the wage of sin is death separation from God and that you deserve that death and deserve that judgment for your sin. And so just as conviction always comes before conversion, so the gospel condemns before it sets free. We are afflicted by sin and unable to save ourselves. And we must realize that and be brought to that point so that we can then look to God with humble hearts that are hungry for salvation. And so we realize that without bread to sustain our life, without bread to save us, that we must look to Jesus who is the bread of life. Without water to drink, to quench our thirsty soul, we look to Jesus Christ who is the fount of living water that we never thirst again. But we must first be thirsty. We must first be hungry. We must first realize what beggars and how spiritually bankrupt we are. I wish I had time to read all of these, but just a couple of Isaiah chapter 41, verses 17 and 18. The afflicted and needy are seeking water, but there is none. And just like man is seeking happiness and man is seeking purpose in life, but there's none to be found outside of God. And their tongue is parched with thirst. 
I, the Lord, will answer them myself. As the God of Israel, I will not forsake them. I will open rivers on their bare heights and springs in the midst of their valleys. I will make the wilderness a pool of water and the dry land fountains of water. God said, I can quench their thirst. I can fulfill what they seek and what they need. Isaiah 57, 15. For thus says the high and exalted one who lives forever, whose name is holy. I will dwell on a high and holy place. And also I will dwell with the contrite and lowly of spirit in order to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. Where we begin our service today in Isaiah chapter 66, verse 2. Who does the God of the, of the Bible look to? Who does the God who created all these things look to? The one who is humble and contrite of spirit and who trembles at his word. It begins with this humility. It begins with this spiritual poverty. It begins in salvation. It begins here in sanctification it begins here. It is an ongoing theme in our life as Christians. We must begin with God here. God, I'm empty. I don't have anything. I can't bring anything. If I'm to be saved, you're going to have to save me. God does save us, and we don't get high-headed and big-headed then. We continue to live a life of, God, I need you. And, God, I can't do anything without you. And, God, I can't accomplish this on my own. Martin Lloyd-Jones, the great preacher, said these words concerning these verses. Quote, the Sermon on the Mount comes to us and says, There is a mountain you have to scale, the heights you have to climb. And the first thing you realize as you look at that mountain which you are told you must ascend is that you cannot do it. That you are utterly incapable in and of yourself and that any attempt to do it on your own strength is proof positive that you have not understood it. It condemns at the very outset the view that regards the Sermon on the Mount as a program for a man to put into operation immediately just as he is, end quote. Everything that's in the Sermon on the Mount is not something that we are to conform our lives to immediately. They are things that can only be attained by the grace of God. You can't scale the mountain. You can't live up to the standards. You can't be holy as God requires you to be holy in and of yourself. You must realize first, I cannot climb that. I can't do what God requires of me to do. And in that spiritual poverty, we are now vessels fit for God to work in. And God says, by my grace you can. And by my grace you will. Poverty of spirit is knowing that we are nothing, have nothing, can do nothing in our own strength in the presence of God. We say with all of our heart, Woe is me, the sinner. We cry unclean, unclean in and of ourselves in the presence of God. And we look to the Lord in utter submission and dependency upon His grace and mercy for our salvation through Jesus Christ. And that never changes it is our ongoing theme in this life. The Holy Spirit begins this work as a first step to be brought into God's kingdom. And He continues this work as one who is in the kingdom. Let me put it this way. Just as a poor person physically is constantly aware of their physical needs. So an individual who is poor in spirit is constantly aware of their spiritual needs. 
There is a continual, perpetual filling of God. But as we continually empty ourselves, we are con continuously, constantly aware of His need to fill us more. And that's what it means to be filled by the Spirit. It means to be controlled by the Spirit. That I'm emptying myself of self. I'm putting off the old man. I'm putting off all those old things. Putting on the new man in Christ. Filling my heart. Washing my heart in the Word of God. And so as I'm emptying myself in humility before God. God is equipping me and encouraging me. And giving me what I need in His Word. So that I am influenced. So that I am permeated by His Word. And that His Word sustains me. His Word propels me. His Word encourages me. His Word provides all that I need according to His riches in glory. And do you know, church, where we have this awareness? Do you know where we have this awareness at the most? In God's presence. I want to give you a phrase that some of you know, some of you don't. But we are to live, every Christian is to live Coram Deo. C-O-R-A-M, Coram Deo. And what that is is simply a Latin phrase that means in the face of God. We are to live in the face of God, meaning we are to live in the constant presence of God under the authority of God for the glory of God of God. And when we live Coram Deo, when we live in the constant presence and face of God, it changes how we view ourselves. It changes how we live, how we talk, how we dress, how we everything, because we are living in the full presence and under the full authority of God. This is the humble self-abasement that Jesus both commends and commands because God resists the proud but God gives grace to the humble number four and very quickly I want you to see the exclusivity blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs and when I say the, exclu the exclusivity, what I'm saying is when you see those two words for theirs, it means for theirs and theirs alone. That this present blessing and reality of being in the kingdom of heaven is theirs and no one else's. That the sum total of all that it means to be in the kingdom and belong to the king is theirs and theirs alone. And if it is theirs and theirs alone, the question we must ask then is what must we do to have this humility and this awareness of our spiritual poverty? And I I want to give you that answer and the quote of a great preacher in our day. He answers that question this way, quote, Humility is not a necessary human work to make us worthy. It is a necessary divine work to make us see that we are unworthy and cannot change our condition without God. Now that's good. Because what he's saying is you're already messing up when you start saying, what do I have to do? What do I have to do? And the same thing is to the beggar. What The beggar says, what must I do? Well, look to the one who can give. Look to the one who in love and, and graciousness is extending the bread and extending the wine. Look to the one who is providing those things. And so if we want to use the language of what do I do, then think of it this way. Begin by taking your eyes off of yourself and look to God alone and seek His face, praying for Him to work this spiritual poverty in your heart. Pray to God as David did in Psalm 51. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Number five, and finally, I want you to see the certainty. The verse ends this way. 
Blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs, and here's where we are, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What's the certainty? Well, it's right there in is. <laughs> Ain't that good? When he says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, Jesus is saying there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. It's theirs. It's not was, past tense. It's not will be, future tense. It is. It's right now. Right now, it's theirs. It is a certainty that the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Now, notice an interesting fact very quickly. Look at the very last beatitude, verse 10. What is the promise to that beatitude? That theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What does verse 3 say? Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. These are the only two beatitudes that match with the same promise. They're like bookends. And they're communicating that we belong to a different kingdom. They're communicating like the Psalms does in Psalm 34, 6, that this poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. And when he saved us, he put us in a different kingdom. And so everything in between verse 3 and verse 10 is who we are in that kingdom. Now the question is, what is the kingdom of heaven? What is the kingdom of God? And the answer to that is this. The kingdom of heaven is where Jesus' authority and reign is in practice. That's where the kingdom of heaven is. Where is the kingdom of heaven? It is anywhere where Jesus is and Jesus' authority is reigning in that place. If you were to look at Matthew chapter 12, verse 28, you'll see where Jesus said the kingdom's among you. What was he saying? He was saying, I am the kingdom. And I, Jesus Christ, in your presence, is the kingdom here. If you were to look in Luke chapter 17, verses 20 and 21, you'll see where Jesus said they're going to say, here it is and there it is and, and that this is the kingdom and that's the kingdom. But listen, the kingdom of heaven right now is the rule and reign of his authority in the hearts of his people. And one day, he will return... And he will usher in that kingdom and that reign over all the earth. But it's not so right now. Now he's Lord, whether you make him Lord or not. But in his long suffering, in his mercy, he has not implemented the fullness of his kingship and lordship. Right now, the kingdom of heaven is his church. It is his bride. It is where his presence resides in the hearts of his believers. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And because Christ's presence is in you as a follower of Christ, then his authority and his rule and his reign as Lord is operative in your life. So blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs and theirs alone is with certainty the kingdom of heaven. Philippians 3.20 says that our citizenship is in heaven. It is not of this world for we have been rescued from the domain of darkness and transferred into the kingdom of his beloved son. Colossians 1.13 And so this morning, if there is to be a revival, it will not come because we become more like the world. Becoming more like the world doesn't usher in revival. It never has, it never will. Revival will come when we are altogether different than the world. 
And in our difference and in our distinction from the world, the glories and the excellencies of Christ in the gospel are put on display. And in being more like Christ, we point others to the power of Christ to also change them. That's when revival comes. Because we are a people who are under His reignship, under His rule and reign. And we are being conformed into His image. And as we are being conformed into His image, and we come out from among them, and be separate, says the Lord, in that distinction, we become that light that shines brightly in a world where so many are only putting off darkness. And that light is not our own light. It's His light. It's His light as He's changing us, as He's molding us, as He's making us more like Him, that we are loving like Jesus, that we are giving like Jesus, that we are forgiving like Jesus, that we are bold promoters of the truth like Jesus and in every way we are becoming more and more like him this morning as we close this message what are we to do with this how are we to respond I believe we must begin by asking some self examining questions such as these Am I poor in spirit? How do I truly think of myself? How highly do I really think of myself? Or how lowly in the face of God do I really view myself? Do I belong to the kingdom of heaven? Am I ruled by Christ as my king and my Lord? And church, have we become like the Laodicean church? In Revelation chapter 3, when Jesus speaks to this church, and the Bible says in verse 17, Jesus speaking, Because you, church, say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need for nothing. And Jesus says, And you do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Have we left where we were when God first saved us? When God first saved you, if you were truly saved, you were spiritually bankrupt. Have you gone beyond that? Are you rich, wealthy, and have need of nothing? Or do you still find yourself in the face of God, poor, wretched, blind, in and of yourself? in as much need for Jesus in your life today as you ever needed Jesus in your life. This morning, if you're not saved, as you look at Christ, how can you feel anything other than absolute spiritual poverty and emptiness? And as you look to him who offers everything, you say, what must I do? You must do simply what the words of the song we're about to sing says. And that is, say, nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to your cross I cling. I have nothing. I can do nothing. I can bring nothing but I fall upon your feet as a beggar in need of salvation. And with that heart and attitude of repentance and faith and humility before Christ, the Bible says there is salvation to be found. That he will give water to your thirsty soul that you never thirst again. 
that he will give bread to your soul, so to speak, that you never hunger again for that saving grace, but that God will make you his own, will wash you of those sins, and will bring you into his glorious kingdom through his Son, Jesus Christ. I trust this morning that we as God's people will see the value and the importance of being poor in spirit. And I pray that those who are lost here today would also see the need of that as well as we pray.